state can be done one of two ways. You can have a preliminary hearing. A preliminary hearing is very similar to a trial. Some consider it like a mini trial because it does in fact have very uh, similar attributes. It includes a public proceeding, an open court, a judge being as a magistrate, a recording of the hearing is actually done, and also in that situation you actually have a, a defense attorney who has the right to cross-examine any witness that comes in front of the preliminary hearing. The other way that this, our state and some other states actually do it is through what's known as a grand jury. It is more commonly used in our state. It's been used for over 150 years. The differences from a preliminary hearing include the following. It is in secret. It's a secret proceeding, not open to the public. There is no judge or magistrate, but instead a grand jury of seven individuals. It takes five of those seven to return what's known as a true vert, uh, bill to actually bind someone over for actually being charged. Uh, there are no official recordings of the testimony of the witnesses in a grand jury in this state at this time. But instead, what we do is we have a juror of the grand jury uh, who has been selected to take handwritten notes from each of the statements. Um, and clearly, there's no uh, defense attorney in the room or involved in a grand jury proceeding. Now, the purpose of Senate Bill 505B is to create an accurate record of the testimony presented to the grand jury for consideration in determining whether criminal charges should, in fact, be brought against an individual. In other words, it, the question is, should the state of Oregon indict an individual to stand trial for a criminal charge? SB 505B will include some transparency into this process. Oregon is one of only two states that currently uses some type of grand jury model that does not require a recording of the testimony. Currently, as I stated, uh, the grand juror, a grand juror is selected. They are there to take written notes of the testimony. And then at that point, I can tell you this. No matter how good that individual is who selected to take those notes in the grand jury proceeding, they will not get everything correct. They will not get it all ver uh, verbatim. I know this firsthand because in my days and working in the Lane County uh, Circuit, uh, uh, District Attorney's Office on Team A, which was a felony property team, I presented cases to the grand jury on numerous, numerous occasions over about a year to a year and a half. During that period of time, clearly individuals who made notes were filtering through what they heard and what they thought they heard, but they were not getting everything verbatim. The second reason for having uh, Senate Bill 505B is to ensure the witnesses' statements that are presented to the grand jury to determine whether or not an indictment should be uh, handed down is the same statements and testimony they provide when they testify at the circuit court trial. The def uh, defense attorneys will, will be provided a copy of these recordings. That's what Senate Bill 505 requires. This will, in fact, show, in fact, uh, at making certain that an individual statements to the grand jury are the same as to what they testify at the circuit court level. If they're not, then they will be subject to impeachment for those. They could also be uh, subject to other charges such as false swearing. It should be noted that uh, the, it is expected that the de uh, defense attorneys will, in fact, receive a copy of the recordings with the condition that in some cases a protective order may be uh, imposed to limit the disclosure to a defendant or others. Exception to the rule is that the recording will not be released. In other words, it is anticipated that the recording will in fact be released. In fact, we have taken what was known as the second highest standard that we have in the state of burden of proof, compelling and substantial uh, proof or circumstances as to why a protective order should in fact be granted and why it should in fact be held against uh, not allowing for the disclosure of the proceedings, the recordings that happened at grand jury. I'll give you a couple examples, Mr. President, of how this works in other areas of protective orders. In the FAPA, which is the Family Abuse Protection Act, there you have a preponderance of the evidence as to whether the victim of abuse uh, within the 180 days, whether uh, there's an intimate danger for further abuse, and the respondent is credible threat to it. But that's at the standard of a preponderance. For a stalking order, it's the same preponderance. And uh, at this point, as to whether or not there's an intentional or other mental ray uh, repeating the unwanted contact of the person 
alarming or coercing the other uh, with an objective standard being applied, reasonable apprehension that the personal safety of the victim or household of family member. So with that, then you have the situation of having a protective order for a grand jury proceeding. Here again, we are assuming and presumption is that the uh, grand jury recordings will in fact be released to the defense attorney. The district attorney will have these following uh, uh, requirements. They must include specific description, including the date and time of the portion of the audio recording, the notes, the reports, or the transcript uh, to be redacted. The court will then take that motion and will look for, again, substantial and compelling circumstances in granting a motion of a protective order of not allowing for or requir uh, requiring certain uh, redactions. Now, there are other type of redactions that are, in fact, required, including personal identifiers that are automatic to be done. Uh, the factors the court will be taking in consideration as to whether or not they should grant the motion will be for the protection of the witnesses or others from physical harm, threats of harm, bribes, economic interference, reprisals, or other forms of intimidations, maintenance of uh, secrecy such as having uh, informants that are involved in the uh, conduct and ensuring that their protection and not in fact uh, bothering or interfering, I should say, with other uh, criminal investigations. The confidentiality information recognized under law is also one that the court would look at or any other relevant conditions. Again, I can't stress enough that it is assumed that these recordings will in fact be released to the grant, uh, from the grand jury's recordings to the defense. Uh, and the court again has a, the second highest standard that we have in our rule and our law of substantial and compelling circumstances before they would grant that motion. This is an opportunity, Mr. President, for us to move forward and make certain that our state is in line with the vast, vast, vast majority of other states that have grand jury proceedings where they do in fact require, uh, require recordings and it will in fact ensure that an individual who gives testimony at the grand jury's testimony does not change and uh, to a different story when they are t uh, uh, on the stand for the actual criminal trial in the, uh, in the circuit court. Thank you, Mr. President. We're now under discussion. I recognize Senator Betsy Johnson.